Number one is okay. In the manage, I am not teaching the management of DK, but what is the principle? What are the priorities of management of the? I will tell you the three things, and you have to tell what should be the number one, what should be number two priority, what should be number three. I will write. Fluid balance should be done. Number two, always write, not aggressively. <laughs> because I'm always afraid of young doctor that if I develop DKA and he rapidly give me insulin. Right? Uh, right, insulin replacement. Right, but not very. Re Remember, insulin should be given to prevent the ketogenesis. Insulin should not be given in such a high amount that rapidly all glucose goes to the peripheral tissue. You are understanding? Right? The real thing is killing is ketogenesis here. So just even you give the moderate level of insulin that will prevent the lipolysis and ketogenesis. Is that right? Okay. And a third thing I am writing is electrolyte balance. Uh, yes, electrolyte balance. Is that right? Now, you have to give the fluid, you have to give the insulin, and, and you have to give the electrolyte balance in which you have to take care of what? Especially potassium care. Initially, it will be high, and later on, it should be low, and it should not be low because you will be intelligent in replacing it. Is that right? Now, tell me. Out of these three things, this question goes to really the people who have done step two and step three, they are preparing for that. How you will set the priority? What is number one out of this? What is number two priority? What is number three priority? Yes. Uh, peep, yes. What is the, you think what is the most important priority when a patient come to you? Patient come to you, you just smell small breathing, order you know it's diabetic ketoacidosis. If you can do the diagnosis, of course, you will take the blood samples for the different tests and then you will start the treatment. And the treatment priorities, what is number one out of these three things? You, feel, you think number one should be electrolyte and number two should be? Insulin and number three should be? Fluid balance. Yes, what do you think, doctor? First, you think the fluid balance should be number one, insulin should be number two and potassium should be number three. Okay, he is uh, differing with you. Anyone else has a different opinion? It should be electrolyte and then fluid and then insulin. Listen, listen, I have written these things in the right order. Number one is number one. <laughs> fluid balance. Number two is number two, insulin. Number three is number three, potassium. I am telling you my friends, when you start, listen now. When you start, the, you will kill your patient. <laughs> yeah. With number one, this, number two, this, number three, be, be, believe me. Todo morta. Right? Now listen. Why? I was telling you that when patient come initially, potassium is high. At the top, you give him potassium, you kill him. First of all, give fluids, then give insulin, then give potassium. Because I told you previously that initially when patient come, potassium level is high. And if you do a proper treatment, then potassium start coming down. And proper treatment is fluid and insulin. And then it will come down and then you will replace. Am I clear? Right? It doesn't matter. Little embarrassment, but you will save the patients. Right? Okay. When a patient come, number one priority is fluid replace event. Number two priority is give the insulin because insulin will, what is the most important thing insulin will do in this patient? Push the glucose into peripheral cell, wrong. Most important thing is it will stop ketogenesis. We don't give heavy amount of insulin to push the glucose into cells. It's the life and death method of diabetic ketoacidosis. You know why? Listen. If you are the really that aggressive doctor, you think, oh, glucose is 500 milligram, very high in the blood, I give heavy insulin, okay. You start giving heavy insulin, glucose rapidly 500, 400, 300, 200, you say, okay, I've made the glucose normal, maybe 100. But when glucose rapidly, when insulin operated entry of glucose occur to the tissues, along with the glucose, massive amount of potassium also goes into cell. 
actually by giving heavy amount of insulin you are pushing the glucose into heavy concentration into cells you are actually taking very high risk of hypokalemia which definitely kills if it is severe but producing cardiac arrhythmias is that right so what we do really that we give small amount of insulin but constantly repeatedly either we give continuous intravenous infusion of insulin or repeatedly intramuscular injections of insulin right so that constant trickling of insulin goes on and this actually primarily arrests the ketogenesis so the liver does not have fatty acid to produce more ketones but before that even you have given fluid why you have given fluid because renal blood flow will become okay and if renal blood flow is good ketones are normally going out through this is that right now after having all these things we come back then what happens to fluid level in the body balance in the body originally when glucose level in the blood was high of course when glucose level in the blood was high then glucose total amount of glucose which was filtered was more so glucose load was very very high in the glomerular filtrate normally in normal healthy person all the glucose which is filtered is reabsorbed from here from proximal convoluted tubule is that right but in diabetes glucose level in the blood becomes so high that filtered load of glucose becomes so much excessive that proximal convoluted tubular cells in spite of their all effort to reabsorb the glucose some glucose cannot be reabsorbed and that glucose will trickle into urine so what really happens that in uh, all diabetic patient when glucose level in the blood is high when plasma concentration of glucose is high then glomerular load of filtered glucose is very high then proximal convoluted tubular cells reabsorb most a maximum amount of glucose but still some glucose will left in the luminal fluid and will come into urine so what happens with this patient most of most of urine. glucose is coming into urine and that produces glucose glucose urea when glucose urea is there that this glucose normally which is reabsorbed now extra glucose when it is going down it osmotically pulls the luminal water normally if 100 ml fluid is filtered normally in every person every minute if 100 ml fluid is filtered how much fluid normally come here as urine every minute every minute in a normal person if 120 ml glomerular filtrate is there you know 120 ml fluid is filtered every minute here right only 1% come out as a urine out of 100 ml only 1 ml come out as urine 99% of the water is reabsorbed normally but this time because glucose load was very high extra glucose is going down this is dra dragging the water with it it is not preventing the water reabsorption why because when glucose stays here water cannot reabsorb amount of water in the lumen become more water will move slowly or fastly fastly so tubular flow become fast and we say glucose has osmotically dragged water with it and that will produce poly urea poly urea now with this poly urea is that right another problem which will occur is that ketone bodies also appear into urine so there is also ketone ketone urea so there is glucose urea poly urea and with that ketone urea now ketones are going down and glucose is going down both of them are dragging the water and lot of water is going down it means this water movement in the lumen is slow or fast fast when water is moving very fast can the tubular cells take up all the electrolyte back no, no. so many electrolytes unwantedly go along the they are flushed with the water many electrolytes are flushed with the water what are those electrolyte number one is potassium right especially in these cells these cells secrete potassium principal cells is that right 
last part of the nephron, the potassium secreting cells. Now, because what is happening that here water is moving very, very fast. So, potassium concentration in the lumen become very low. low. So, from the cell, potassium rapidly come here. So, potassium secretion is going on into urine, excessive. So, there is Kelly's urea, loss of potassium also. So, not only potassium is lost into urine, other substances like phosphate and magnesium cannot be reabsorbed because to reabsorb phosphate and magnesium and right fluid should move slowly so that these cells can work on the luminal fluid and capture the and capture the reabsorb the phosphates and magnesium and because they cannot because there's very fast flush of water so other electrolyte like magnesium and phosphates are also lost right anyway in this patient when there is glucose is lost into urine and polyuria is there, ketone urea is there and potassium is also being lost into urine. Along with that, there is another trouble going on. When there is polyuria, when there is polyuria, blood osmolality will go up, blood will become concentrated. When blood osmolality go up, osmoreceptors in hypothalamus will trigger the feeling of thirst. So of course, as all of you know, this is associated with poly. Dipsia. So actually, these patients before going into coma, they are having polydipsia, they are having polyuria, and because amino acid level in the blood is high and free fatty acid level in the blood is high, and this can go to hypothalamus and stimulate some centers in hypothalamus, and you develop polyphagia. So these patients before going into coma, they are having polyuria and polyphagia and polydipsia. Is that right? But as time passes by, more and more ketones accumulate into blood, especially when bicarbonate level has gone down, down, and there's not enough bicarbonate to, to uh, neutralize the ketones or acids. When ketonemia becomes severe, these acids irritate the central nervous system, nausea center and vomiting center and directly irritate the GIT. That stimulates nausea and vomiting. Let me tell you, these ketone bodies have a powerful stimulant action on the medulla. Number one, they make the respiration, small respiration. Number two, they stimulate the chemotrigger zone and they activate the nausea and vomiting situation. So these patients also develop nausea and then vomiting and patient is not only losing fluid into urine but also patient is losing fluid and vomiting. Right? Actually in any patient with insulin dependent diabetes mellitus unexplained, unexplained nausea and vomiting should prompt in the doctor's mind the possibility of DKA in any patient who is insulin dependent diabetes mellitus patient right unexplained nausea vomiting should prompt the doctor's mind to think about DKA of course there are some nausea vomitings because all the family took the rice and there were some problem and everyone is vomiting right <laughs> of course that situation is different so what is happening with these patients with these patients, there's severe fluid losses through urinary system as well as through the gastrointestinal system. So they're progressively becoming dehydrated. They are progressively becoming dehydrated. And the worst thing which happens with the dehydration is that renal blood flow becomes less. And ability of kidney to clear the acetone is, oh sorry, ability of the kidney to clear the ketone body is further reduced. So why? Hyperketonemia, why ketonemia develop? Number one mechanism. Lipolysis providing lot of fatty acid to the liver and hepatic mitochondria producing lot of ketones. So number one, why ketonemia develop? Due to excessive production of ketone. Number two, in the deficiency of insulin, peripheral tissues cannot use the ketone. Normally, a little amount of ketone bodies which are produced or during fasting or some conditions when ketone bodies are produced, some of the peripheral tissues can use ketone bodies as fuel in the presence of insulin. Because insulin is absent, the ketones which are produced, can they be utilized? No. So peripheral tissue cannot utilize and break down the ketones. So peripheral ketolysis becomes less. So number one, ketones produced are more. 
due to severe deficiency of insulin triggering lipolysis and hepatic production of ketones number two due to severe deficiency of insulin peripheral tissue cannot do ketolysis number three because there have been severe dehydration due to polyuria and vomiting renal blood flow has dangerously impaired and ketone bodies are not present uh, the uh, kidney is unable to clear the ketone bodies out of the body. So there is increased production of ketone, there is increased ketolysis by the peripheral tissue and decreased elimination of renal elimination of ketones. So as time passes by this very accelerated accumulation of ketone bodies in the blood. Is it clear? Plus polyuria, polydipsia, polyphagia, nausea and vomiting, these are the initial features. And sometimes GIT is so much irritated, right? Patient develop abdominal pain. And sometimes abdominal pain is so severe that you may think it is acute surgical abdomen. Right? Sometimes you think it may be acute pancreatitis. Do you think acute pancreatitis has increased risk in DK? Yeah. It is. Yeah. Right now, let me discuss a little bit this. Actually, in the patient with DKA, Serum amylase level goes up. Serum amylase. If there is a patient with DKA and you take the blood level and serum amylase level is high, what does it mean? That patient is also having? Patient is also having? Acute pancreatitis. You are absolutely wrong. Listen carefully. Serum amylase in this condition is coming mainly from salivary origin and some of it is for pancreatic origin. So when a patient comes with DKA, serum amylase are elevated. Only an elevation of amylase in the serum does not tell you or confirms you that this is panc acute pancreatitis. Why? Because uh, serum amylase enzyme which is elevated, uh, it may be coming from the saliva or may be coming from pancreas. But we know, but we know that in patient with DKA, there is increased risk of pancreatitis. Why? Because severe lipolysis produces lot of free fatty acid and if it is prolonged situation, liver will start producing lot of triglyceride. And hypertriglyceridemia is a very important risk factor for pancreatitis. So actually, in patient with DKA, there is increased risk of pancreatitis, but pancreatitis should not be diagnosed alone on abdominal pain and alone on serum amylase level. If you think there is pancreatitis, you immediately ask for serum lipase enzyme level. What is enzyme level? Serum lipase. Because serum lipase is elevated only in pancreatitis. That is more specific uh, for the pancreatitis, especially in DKA patient. Am I clear? And if serum amylase is high as well as serum lipase is high, then of course it is pancreatitis. Is that right? Am I really clear? Okay, thank you for listening. Now, so glucose coming here, glucose urea is there and osmotic diuresis is there and polyuria is there and ketone urea is there and potassium is lost along with that other electrolyte phosphate and magnesium are also lost. Uh, here the circulatory system is shrinking. So eventually renal blood flow become less due to reduce renal blood flow. Not only the capability to get rid of ketone is reduced, but azotemia may develop. What may develop? Azotemia. Azotemia. What is azotemia? Yes, what is azotemia? When due to impaired renal function, blood chemistry is disturbed. Usually blood urea and creatinine goes up. So it means in these patients at advanced stages, blood urea and creatinine level will also go up because oligourea may develop. Renal blood flow becomes very less and urine formation becomes very less due to dehydration. Is that right? Pardon? Pre-renal azotemia, of course, it is initially pre-renal azotemia until you don't, until the severe problem patient develop acute tubular necrosis. But let's hope your patient does not go to that, right? So, 
Am I clear? Now, features of fluid, body fluid deprivation will also develop. What will be those clinical features? Number one, due to dehydration. Of course, due to dehydration, patient will develop dry tongue, dry mucous membranes, reduce skin turgor, reduce skin turgor, and patient will develop due to uh, reduced uh, fluid balance in the body, patient will develop tachycardia, patient will develop oligosuria, patient will develop hypotension eventually. Eventually blood pressure will start falling. Why the blood pressure falls? There are two mechanisms, one I will tell you, one is reduced blood volume. What is the second reason that in these patients blood pressure will fall? Acidosis dilates peripheral blood vessels. In very advanced stage of this disease, when blood pressure is falling rapidly, why the blood pressure is falling, there is hypertension, number one because there is less, there is volume, volume depletion, circulatory volume depletion. And second reason is that, yes, their acidosis is dilating the peripheral arterioles. That also contribute to the fall in the blood pressure. So these patients are having fall in the blood pressure. All these things are of course affecting your central nervous system also, right? This central nervous system, number one, what are the problems with central nervous system now? Number one, Number one, high level of glucose is disturbing it. Number two, high levels of ketone bodies and acids are disturbing the central nervous system, depressing the central nervous system. Number three, high level of hyperosmolarity is disturbing the central nervous system. Listen, how many things? High glucose is disturbing, right? Number one, low pH is disturbing. Now, of course, increased ketone bodies are disturbed, depressing the CNS. Acidosis also depresses the CNS. And of course, hyper osmo increase osmolality, osmolality of blood also disturb the central nervous system. And central nervous system undergoes depression, patient become little bit drowsy and stuprosed. And eventually, if you don't manage the patient appropriately, patient may go into coma. Is that right? Okay. What do you think? Which is the most important thing which depresses the out of these things? High glucose. Acidosis, hyperketonemia, hyperosmolarity, all these things occur in these patients. Depression of central nervous system is directly proportional to which one of these? Of course, all of them are contributing, but one of them is most strongly contributing. Yes, ketone bodies. pH, you think? Acidosis is the most important thing which is disturbing CNS function. You think it's ketone bodies. Uh, Dr. Uh, Wahid Nuri thinks it's hyperosmolality which is disturbing CNS. Anyone else has a different opinion? <laughs> yes, you think it's high glucose. The right answer is hyperosmolality. Dr. Wahid Nuri is absolutely right. Actually, the depression in central nervous system, degree of depression of central nervous system is directly proportional to the hyperosmolarity. You know how to determine the osmolality of blood? Do you want to say something about it? If, you, if this is your patient, how you will determine the osmolarity of the blood? Because normal osmolarity of blood is somewhere between, yes Dr. Nuri, what is the? 299. 290? It is about actually around 290, okay. right? But to, to be very specific, it ranges from 287 to 297, right? But normally, it is 290 milli or small per liter. Is that right? This is normal osmolarity of the blood due to the solutes. When osmolarity is more than 320 milli or small per liter, central nervous system start going depression. Is that right? And they have seen as the similarity keep on increasing progressively, central nervous system depression become more and more progressive. There is direct correlation with it. Am I clear? Now, how do you determine the osmolarity? Anyone? Osmolarity is equal to? 2 into sodium, yes, plus potassium, very good. 
प्लस ब्लड ग्लूकोज प्लस यूरिया राइट ब्लड ग्लूकोज बाय 18 ब्लड ग्लूकोज इन मिलीग्राम पर डीएल डिवाइडेड बाय 18 फॉर एग्जांपल इफ योर ब्लड ग्लूकोज इज 180 मिलीग्राम इन इन सम पेशेंट ब्लड ग्लूकोज इज 180 यू विल डिवाइड बाय 18 सो इट विल बिकम हाउ व्हाट इज द आंसर 10 इन द सेम वे ब्लड यूरिया इफ इट इज 20 to 40 mg per dl divided by 2.8 am i right bjo and mean blood urea nitrogen i'm saying the same thing okay thank you for confirming me <laughs> right right now listen in a normal healthy person let's do the osmolality this is a young man what's your name jeffrey so mr jeffrey we are going to determine your osmolality let's suppose your sodium report come one 35 milli equivalent potassium is 5 milli equivalent so what is this 140 plus blood blood glucose is 180 so if it is 180 divided by 18 is 10 and your blood urea is 28 right and it is 10 now this is 135 plus 5 is 140 145 140 by 2 is 2 80 plus this 10 plus those 10 that is around 300 so around 300 is normal is that right actually this value is less normally right so in this way you determine what plasma osmolarity in these patient plasma osmolarity goes up why number one the most important reason because there have been fluid deficiency you have been losing lot of fluid into urine and vomiting and that lead to constriction uh, high hyper concentration of the blood hemo concentration right so osmolality goes up number 1 number 2 blood glucose is of course high in this patient and eventually when azotemia develop when renal blood flow become impaired even bju and also goes up so due to and in the beginning potassium is also up so all these things contribute to hyper osmolality which disrupt the central nervous system any question up to this you want to know about anion gap okay how many of you are really clear about anion gap anion gap term is used when we say that patient have acidosis some people have acidosis with normal anion gap some people have acidosis with increased anion gap so who has the concept of anion gap raise your hands just to remind you everyone has two hands yes use them <laughs> yes you have two hands who has okay the people who have heard there is a term called an anion gap raise their hands someone who has heard there is something like an anion gap okay there are people who never heard of it i feel sorry for you okay but one day you will the day is today i'm going to explain do you want to really know about an anion gap or sometimes else okay i will explain rapidly even though that is not relevant with this thing i really explain to you okay anion gap first of all you should know body fluids believe in electro neutrality what i mean by electro neutrality if you talk about blood or extracellular fluid or intracellular fluid the cations number of cations and number of anions should be the same equal there is some degree of equality so in a normal person for example mr jaffrey is again there and let's suppose he is normal right now he is healthy and physically and mentally normal now we check his blood blood chemistry in blood chemistry of jaffrey on one side we write down cations on other side we write down anions ideally number of cations and anion should be equal now let's measure the major cations in the blood first of all we measure the major cations in the blood most important cation in the blood is sodium let us suppose his sodium level is 135 milli equivalent per liter and second major cation is potassium so even if you want you can measure the potassium with it which is about 5 milli equivalent per liter in a normal person so total cation total cations in a person who is a uh, normal 
total cation or how much if you measure these two cations? There are some other cations also like magnesium and like calcium and but we are not measuring them. In Jaffrey's blood, in our student blood, we have measured only two major cations. Sodium is 135, potassium is? So total is how much? Total cations are 140 milli equivalent per liter. Is that right? Now we measure the major anions. Major anion in his blood is number one is chloride. And chloride is normally about 100 milli equivalent per liter approximately. About 100 milli equivalent or 105. Uh, Dr. Nuri, what is the level of chloride normally? 97 to? 100, it is 97 to 107, right? So let's make it in your favor, we make it 105. Still it is normal, right? So Jaffrey, your chloride level in the blood is 105 milli equivalent per liter. And let's suppose your bicarbonate in the blood, bicarbonate, I will put it uh, with this color. It is 25. Bicarbonate is 25. I think I should put some more seductive color. Okay, let me make it with the, this color. This is your bicarbonate and bicarbonate is how much? 25. Right? Now, we have measured two major cations and we have measured in his blood two major anions. But in fact, in fact, there are more cations there. We did not measure. For example, there is magnesium, there is calcium and little more cations we did not measure. And in the same way here, there are more anions which we did not measure. Truly speaking, cations and anions are absolutely equal. But these are unmeasured cations, these are unmeasured anions. These unmeasured anions are normally your phosphates, yes, proteins, proteins are electrically negatively charged, what else, sulfates, phosphates, sulfate, proteins and some other. So these are unmeasured anions, these are unmeasured cations. We are not measuring it in laboratory, in routine thing and we are not measuring this. And measured are only this. Measured cations are these two. And measured anions are these two. Now, in measured anion, what is the total? 130. Is that right? 105 is the chloride and 25 is this. Now, this is measured cations and this is measured anions. Right? Truly speaking, if you measure all the cations and all the anions, they will be equal. But if you two, if you measure two important cations and measure two most important anions, the value will be cations minus anions is equal to 140 minus 130. How much is the difference? 10. This is called normal N gap that this is a gap. Measured cations are up to this, measured anions are up to this and this is the gap. Truly speaking, in the body, there is no gap. There are important gaps. I mean in the blood, cations and anion difference, there is no gap. This area is occupied by unmeasured. You are getting it? You are clear? Right? So normal person, in normal blood chemistry, there is some anion gap. Normal anion gap is uh, from 8 to 16, value is 8 to 16. Or on average you can say it is 12, right? So this is normal anion gap. This is normal anion gap. Is that clear to you? There is no problem, right? Now you, you imagine what happened in diabetic ketoacidosis. In diabetic ketoacidosis, too much ketone bodies are produced. It means too much, uh, what is this, uh, acetoacetic acid, beta-hydroxybutyric acid and acetone are produced. Now these are 
acids these are the acids can you puff them out of the body no you have to first react with bicarbonate convert into carbon dioxide and then you puff out so can you directly puff out especially beta hydroxybutyric acid and acetoacetate can you puff it out no acetone can go out right but these two cannot puff out because they cannot puff out we say these are fixed acid what are they they are fixed acid these fixed acid once they are produced in our body look at this patient is producing a lot of ketone bodies these ketones are reacting with bicarbonate so in the blood bicarbonate level will become high or low low so what really happens that this bicarbonate in this person let's suppose chloride remain the same 105 but problem is that this was 25 but lot of ketone bodies neutralized bicarbonate bicarbonate is only 10 is that right now bicarbonate is only 10 if bicarbonate is only 10 now what happened this area where bicarbonate has been reduced it is occupied by the what is this ketone bodies because ketone bodies are produced they reduce the bicarbonate and then more ketone bodies are accumulated and ketone bodies are retained in the blood and then these are your remaining what was that unmired anions is that right these were normal phosphate lactate and plasma proteins and others but in this disease lot of fixed acid which were produced they destroyed the bicarbonate and bicarbonate level went down in the blood and the gap was that and that reduced bicarbonate right is compensated by presence of ketone, ketone bodies and still in this patient total number of anion and total number of cations are equal is that right but when you will measure then cations will be 135 plus 5 is equal to 140 but when you will measure anions you will only measure these two now it will be 105 plus 10 125 so 140 in this case 140 minus the total cations minus no measured cation minus measured anions what is the difference now 15 milli equivalent per liter actually in these patients even potassium will be little more than normal let us suppose potassium is 6 and sodium is 145 now potassium is 6 sodium is 145 how much it is cations 151 chloride is 105 and bicarbonate is 10 1 25 so what is the anion gap now 26 this is normal anion gap or abnormal anion gap it is abnormal anion gap so what we see this is a person who has acidosis with abnormal anion gap whenever there is abnormal anion gap it means in your body some fixed acid are accumulating what is accumulating some fixed acids are accumulating and they are destroying bicarbonate and anions of the fixed acid are retained and these anions of the fixed acid are because unmeyered they are not measured so total measured anions become less so anion gap increases is that clear now i will tell you some another situation let us suppose someone has acidosis due to loss of bicarbonate some other disease not diabetic ketoacidosis let us suppose there is a person who has a disease in which person is losing out of the body bicarbonate but there is no fixed acid retained if you are losing bicarbonate then in that patient also suppose it is 105 what is this chloride and if you are losing bicarbonate in diarrhea or vomiting right if you are losing bicarbonate out of the body suppose bicarbonate is 10 but if you are losing the bicarbonate out of the body you are not adding fixed acid to the body so do you think there are these anion there no so what happened body has to keep the total number of anion equal to cation body will retain chloride body will retain 
chloride. So in this patient, what really happened? Chloride goes up, and rather than 105, it becomes 125. Is that right? And bicarb is 10. But now if you measure the anion gap, that will be normal. But in this, so those page, those acidosis situation in which bicarbonate are lost out of the body and chloride is retained, chloride is retained, then deficiency of bicarbonate as anion is compensated by retention of chloride. So actually measured anion is reduced and measured anion is increased. So total measured anion remain normal. Total measured anion remain normal. So in this case, cation, measured cations minus measured anion will lead to the normal anion gap. So actually, there are two types of acidosis. One acidosis in which bicarbonate goes down and chloride remain normal. In this case, anion gap increases. Other is when bicarbonate goes down, but chloride increase. We call it hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Hyperchloremic metabolic acidosis. Is that right? In this case, if bicarbonate is less, but what happened? Chloride is retained. So, it is acidosis with normal anion gap. Actually, whenever you have a patient with metabolic acidosis, the first thing is to know the anion gap. If anion gap is increased, then metabolic acidosis is due to accumulation of fixed acid. Fixed acid are like ketone bodies, like lactic acid, any fixed acid. For example, if someone has severe lactic acidosis, lactate retain in the body. Lactate, some of the lactate will destroy the, lactic acid will destroy the bicarbonate and remaining lactate will accumulate. But because lactate is unmeasured, so measured anion will be reduced. So whenever you have metabolic acidosis due to accumulation of fixed acid, whenever you have metabolic acidosis due to accumulation in the body of fixed acid, then bicarbonate is destroyed and the gap produced by the bicarbonate is filled by the anions of the fixed acid. And because the anions of the fixed acid are not measured, so measured anion become less. But when person has metabolic acidosis, but there is no accumulation of metabolic, there is no accumulation of fixed acids. Is that right? In those conditions, if metabolic acidosis is due to loss of bicarbonate. So if someone has metabolic acidosis due to loss of bicarbonate and fixed acid anions are not there, then body will keep its neutrality by retaining chloride. Because chloride is the measured anion, so in spite of the fact that when bicarbonate is lost out of the body and measured bicarbonate is reduced, but at the same time due to retention of chloride for the purpose of electron neutrality, right, another measure, measured anion is increased, hyperchloremic. So, total measured anion remain normal. So anion gap remain normal. I will ask just a question, then we'll finish this lecture. Uh, there, listen, if a patient comes to you and in his, he, is, he has metabolic acidosis. Your professor says this patient is suffering with metabolic acidosis and tell me the cause. One way to divide it, is it metabolic acidosis due to production and retention of fixed acid or it is metabolic acidosis due to bicarb loss, just look at anion gap. If anion gap is too much, what is being retained? Fixed acid. If anion gap is normal, it is hyperchloremic acidosis, it is probably due to bicarbonate loss. But before I really go further, uh, one, two more points about this condition, that patient, many of the patients who are diabetic keto ketoacidosis, they have underlying severe infection. They have underlying severe infection. But to diagnose infection in a patient with diabetic ketoacidosis needs extra layers of cerebral cortex. Extra layers of cerebral cortex. You have to be very intelligent. You know why? 
You know why? Because in diabetic ketosis, there are few things which fool you. There are many things, but I will tell you few things which fool you. For example, if patient has infection, usually fever should be there. But usually the fever should be there. That's the feature of infection. But in diabetic ketoacidosis, usually patient has normal temperature or hypothermia. So very important pointer of the infection, which is high temperature is usually missing in a patient with DKA. Right? So sometimes DKA patient has heavy infection, but there is no fever. And you may think he doesn't have infection. So one of the very reliable indicator of infection is misleading or missing in the patient of DK. This is one important problem which occurs. Another important problem. These ketone bodies and all these metabolic disturbance irritate the bone marrow. Listen carefully. These retained ketones, they irri irritate the bone marrow house. In the bone marrow there are a lot of stored neutrophil. Bone marrow normally has a lot of stored neutrophil. Lot of neutrophil jump to the blood. So, leukocytosis occur. What happened? Leukocytosis occur. Normally, a leukocytosis is a very important feature of infection. But in diabetic ketoacidosis, leukocytosis may occur without infection. So, this is another sign which is present but infection may or may not be there. So, these are two things which are the problems that you have to be very very careful uh, to look for the underlying cause of diabetic ketoacidosis. Usually underlying cause is either it is previously undiagnosed patient of type 1 diabetes or underlying cause is that patient did not take the insulin at all, miss it or there is some underlying catabolic situation, infections or trauma or infarction. And if there is underlying inf infection, you have to take care that patient patient may have infection without fever or patient may have leukocytosis without infection. Is that right? Did you have any question? There's no question. So this, these were a few words about pathogenesis of pathogenesis of diabetic ketoacidosis. How to manage it? We'll talk later. Class dismiss. Thank you.